Look to your left, look to your right. We are all different from each other. Some things are very obvious to see, your height, the color of your hair. Other traits are not as obvious, but still determine us to a very large degree, like your cognitive capacities, how good is your memory, how good is your attention, or your personality. Are you a very extrovert person, a very meticulous person, and so on. And likewise, all of the things that we can measure on the human brain, we also see a large degree of inter-individual variability, whether we look at brain structure, function, or connectivity, interaction. No two of your brains are the same, in the very similar way to none of your physical appearances, none of your mental traits are the same. So what is the overarching goal of our research is to relate that variability on the brain level, on one hand, to factors that influence it, age, gender, genetics, but also things like experience, lifestyle, and so on. And, and that is what I'm going to be very much focusing, almost exclusively focusing on today, can we, from measurements of the brain, predict the inter-individual variability in things like cognitive performance, effective traits, and also, in the clinical domain, psychopathology. How does this work? We start with a fairly large group of volunteers, subjects, and these subjects are placed in an MRI scanner. Now, what's important is that this is not one of the most fancy high-end machines. In fact, we don't want it to be one, but it is one of these scanners that you can find in basically any community hospital. Why is that important? Because if we ultimately want to go to clinical practice, you want to have machines that are available. If you can only do these kind of predictions on a 200 million, one in a world type of machine, then this is never going to help an individual patient presenting here in a hospital, for example, with a potential diagnosis of depression. So we scan the brain, and this is the kind of images we get. Now, these images, although they look quite sort of nice and simple here on the screen, they're actually very high dimensional because for a scan like that, we have about 400,000 data points. Now, you can't even really see them. That's why the images look so smooth. So with this kind of scan, we have already 400,000 data points. If we want to look at interactions between brain regions, then we would be at 400,000 squared. And we've heard about exascale computing beforehand, but even that is not something you can readily work with. Now, the good thing about the brain is that these are not 400,000 independent information, but the brain is organized in a very specific topographic fashion. So I don't going to go into all of the details here, but basically that means we don't have 400,000 independent information, but rather through brain mapping, through identifying areas in the human brain, we can reduce our problem to a few hundred information, few hundred features. If you take that together, the group of subjects and this sort of compressed representation of neurobiology, we end up with this kind of matrix. And if we then have for each of these subjects also information about that subject, like age, gender, whether it's a patient, whatever you are interested in, then we can start and try to train machine learning models that could then make a prediction on a new subject. So not one of the subjects that was in the training group, but a new independent subject. And then for that new subject, predict what this particular feature should be like. So in this case, we could say, well, that subject is most likely 28 years old, female, and uh, a patient. Now, why is that interesting outside of academia? Well, there's actually a huge industry and a huge societal need when it comes to making these kind of inferences about a person. Think about all of the tests that people need to do if they want to regain a revoked driver license. Think about assessment centers. Think about all of the clinical neuropsychology. So up to now, what we really have is a situation where there's a lot of interest from a lot of different fields in finding out the individual traits of a person, 
But all of that is done really by just observing the overt behavior. How good do you score in a particular test, for example? Or what do you answer in an interview? Now, this kind of machinery now will in the future allow to actually perform such kind of predictions, such kind of inferences, based on the brain itself. Now, we've heard we are somewhere between science and science fiction. Now, the scenario that I just described, that is still somewhat science fiction, because we are not good enough yet in terms of our predictions to really deploy it into the real world and replace classical established tests by it. But what I hope I can show you over the next uh, couple of minutes is a series of examples that show that we are making fairly good progress to that end. And I will start with a trait that is very easy to characterize, age. Can we train such model on a large group of subjects to predict the individual age in a new subject? And it turns out we can actually do that quite well. If I just take a five-minute scan of your brain, I can predict your age with a precision of roughly four to five years. This is already quite interesting and quite reassuring, but does it mean anything? In the end, it's nice, it's a nice game, it's a nice toy, but does it mean something? Well, as you see here, it probably does mean something. So here we did the same thing with a group of healthy controls and a group of patients with Parkinson's disease, a neurodegenerative disease. What we could show there is that Parkinson's patients are on average estimated about five to six years older than they really are. For the healthy controls, the mean deviation is about zero. So on average, we are predicting right, but with some variance around it. But the, the average brain of a Parkinson's patient looks about five years older than the patient actually is. So it seems that this is a very interesting way to objectively quantify neurodegeneration. Now, what you could argue is, in the end, we, our human brain, is much better at doing that. If you have a skilled radiologist, that person can probably not predict quite well how old somebody is, but if you give a radiologist a normal brain scan and a Parkinson's brain scan, they can tell you, well, this looks sort of to be pre-aged, advanced age. So the same thing as I showed here in a quantitative fashion, our brains, or the radiologist's brain, can actually do quite well. But can we go beyond that? Can we actually look at things that a radiologist could not tell? Well. Also, I have an example for that, and this is gender. If you give even the best radiologists a brain scan and ask them, tell me if that's a man or a woman, their uh, performance will be chunks level. It's no way you can actually see that on the scan. Now, what we did here now is to look at the connectional architecture. So basically, for each pair of regions, we computed how much are they talking to each other? And then we end up with this kind of matrix, number of regions by number of regions. So each entry here is a measurement of how strongly these regions interact. Now, from this matrix, we can predict whether somebody is a man or a woman in a new unseen subject, not somebody who has been part of the training set, with a precision of about 90%. Now, this is interesting for two aspects. One is, we can actually do very well, something that a radiologist could not do, we can do actually quite well. But on the other thing, on the other side, we're not getting to 100%. So this is actually a, a completely separate line of research we just start to look into, is that, could that be somewhat like an objectification of, for example, the discussions about sex versus gender? Because it seems that some of the male brains look more like female brains, and vice versa. Now, I said we get to about 90% if we take just the whole data. What we then also did is to look at each row here of the data. Now, what does a row mean? Remember, that's number of regions by number of regions. So a row here means we look at the connectivity profile of a single region to all the other regions. Now, what that gives us is a regional specificity. 
we can now for each part of the brain say how well does the connectivity profile of that part to the rest of the brain. How well does that allow to predict gender? And actually, we're not doing too bad. We're not doing equally well across the brain, and that's good, because we know that some parts, like motor cortex, visual cortex, they should not differentiate a lot, and other parts do quite well, up to about 80% precision. And if we then look, what are these parts doing that are very good in predicting, we see that they're involved in aspects like language, emotion processing, and cognitive control. Now, all of what I've talked about now was mainly on the whole brain level, now to some degree in the last example on a regional level. One of the key things about the brain, though, is that it is functionally organized. There's a certain network that you use when you do a memory task, another network that you do when you do a language task, and so on. And there is roughly 30,000 studies in the literature that probe the brain, give the subject the particular task, and see what activates. Now, this is a very big but a very noisy literature. So our approach was to summarize that literature through meta-analysis and then basically use that for machine learning. And it turns out that this actually yields another layer that we can investigate. So this is a cognitive network. These are the regions in the brain that are active when you do a cognitive task. This is a social and effective network. That's the kind of network that activates when you think about your emotions or other people. Now let's try to predict from the connectivity in these networks things like cognitive control performance, executive control. We would hope, obviously, that inter-individual differences in cognitive control is more related to the cognitive control network rather than the emotion network. And this is exactly what we see. So in that network here, we can very well predict that's true measured cognitive performance. That's a predicted one. We can very well predict. Here, we don't predict at all. Skip that for time reasons and really go to the final session. I talked about clinical translation. Can we start to bring that into the clinic? And here, I present you some very initial data where we looked at 300 women after giving birth. Why? Because that's a very vulnerable period for the brain. There's a lot of things happening, all the hormonal changes. And there is a very serious disorder that can happen, which is postpartum depression. About 10% of all women giving birth experience a true depression afterwards. And that's a dangerous condition for both the women and the child. So we tried to actually predict whether these women that we recruited on the maternity ward, just after giving birth, will de develop a depression later. We had a 12-week follow-up. We found about 9% of women actually did become ill. And what we did is to do the prediction with the data to date. So basically what I'm showing you is a change of the prediction accuracy over time. The starting point is right when they gave birth, one to, uh, a few days later, and the end point is 12 weeks later. And that's the curve. And what we see is, here, we are very certain, but it's irrelevant. Why? Because at these times, the women are already depressed. So you don't need a machine learning algorithm, you just see them. Well, if they're not already in the hospital. What is interesting now, if we move to the left, here, they have low mood, but it's still unclear whether that's just the baby blues or the beginning of a relevant depression. And we can have an area under the curve for the classifier of about 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It's not there yet where we can be clinically certain, but we can see it. And interestingly, even the very first time point, still on the ward, just having given birth, we're actually having a way above chance classification rate in terms of predicting who a month or so later will start to develop a depression. That's all. In summary, we want to understand the brain, model inter-individual variability, and then start to use that knowledge to move towards personalized medicine. Thank you very much.